Hey everybody, welcome back. It's Mr. Roll here for week number eight, day number one. Now, as promised every day this week, we're going to be talking about a new change that's coming to the school for next year to help you guys get prepared and get excited for everything that we have in store for you. So, today we are talking about the new layout of classrooms in the Carver building. So the classrooms that we had last year, some of them are changing. In fact, out of our seven classrooms, four of them will be different this next year. And so today we are focusing on the changes in the Carver building. First, before we discuss the changes in the Carver building, let's go ahead and do a quick reminder of where the two buildings' names come from and the scientists that inspired those names. It is easy to see why at first glance people often assume Da Vinci Tree Academy is smaller than it really is. In fact, the school is made up of two sizable buildings, the Carver Building off 22nd and the Curie Building off of Sherwood Village Drive. Students every morning are dropped off at the Carver Building, which is named for scientist George Washington Carver. Born a slave, Carver tore down walls of racial oppression to show that people of any color could become competent scientists. His work in food science continues to benefit us to this day. The second building where students are picked up every day is named for Madame Curie, the French scientist whose pioneering work in physics and chemistry won her multiple Nobel Prizes. She tore down walls of gender oppression to show that women could be amazing scientists, and her family still holds the record for numbers of Nobel Prizes. That was pretty cool. So, now that you remember where the building's names come from, let's go ahead and walk out this door, and I'm going to take you around the Carver Building so we can discuss which rooms are changing for next year. All right, let's go ahead and get to it. So we're going to take everybody on a little tour of the way the school is laid out in the Carver building. Up front here you see we have our little trophies for this year's science fair wins, which we're very proud of. Going down the hall here, as we approach rooms A and B, we hit our first changes. So, as you all know, room A this last year was Mr. Roll's room. Uh, this next year, the room A is going to belong to the fourth and fifth grade. Additionally, we had room B over here, and room B was Miss Kimmy's room. Uh, next year, room B is going to be our second grade room. Room C, which we can walk into. Oh, by the way, rooms A and B, because they're being changed so much, they're currently under remodeling, so we're not going to be going into those rooms because there's a lot that's still up in the air here. As we walk into room C, Miss Lee's room, Miss Lee will be teaching in this room again next year, but this room is going to be set aside for our third grade. So if you're in second grade this year, get ready. You're going to be in third grade in here next year. Very exciting. Okay, so as we head down the hall and we're passing the kitchen, we see our kindergarten room in room D and our first grade room in room E. Now rooms D and E will still be kindergarten and first grade, but the big changes that you can see here are that we're spreading the desks out. So next year, all of our desks are not going to be next to each other or in pods. All of the desks are going to be spaced out. So all of our students have a good amount of space uh, to move around and uh, a good amount of space to themselves. So those are some of the big changes that we have coming for you uh, next year for the, those of you in the Carver building. Okay. Okay, ladies and gentlemen, that's it for our video announcements today, talking about what is new coming up for next year. It's time for us to say our Pledge of Allegiance. So, if you would please stand wherever you are, whether it's in your living room, your bedroom, whether at your grandparents' house, let's take a moment to stand. If you're wearing a hat, please take it off. Please place your right hand over your heart and repeat after me. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, indivisible, under God, with liberty and justice for all. I think I got two lines mixed up there, but that's okay. All right, let's go ahead and get started on today's learning. I hope you have a wonderful day of online learning. Thank you.
All right, ladies and gentlemen, welcome back. Today is the first day of week number eight, uh, and I'm good to see you, uh, or I'm good to see you, I'm glad to see you. Um, and as you can see, my hair is growing back. I got this weird kind of hair helmet going on, and, uh, uh, and for every day, I think for the rest of the time that we are together for these online lessons, I'm going to be wearing a new hat, bringing back some old ones. So today's hat, is this Mickey Mouse hat. These were uh, really popular when I was a kid, and I don't know if they're still popular today for you guys if you go to Disneyland and get one, uh, but this was a Disney hat from many, many years ago, and it kind of matches my red Coca-Cola and Hebrew shirt, and so I'm going to be wearing it today. All right, let's go ahead get this baby on. Look at that. I look so cool. All right, let's go ahead and get started. So first up in life skills, uh, we are going to add on to the lesson that we had last week about choosing your class schedule using a, a course catalog. And so we are going to talk about balancing your course schedule and your GPA uh, because it is very important uh, for you to be able to kind of understand that a little bit. Next up, in current events and economics, we are going to complete our economics portion, not complete it, but kind of round out the end of uh, one piece of this economics portion with a quick and easy quiz over supply and demand. Yeah, and so that's just a PDF. You just have to click and download it off the website. Uh, next up in history, um, wait, we already did that last week, didn't we? No? Okay. Well, if I got it wrong, I got it wrong. So uh, we are taking the Westward Expansion Khan Academy quiz, I suppose. Let me go ahead and double check. Did we do that? Nope. Oh, we didn't take the quiz yet. That's what it was. All right. So today we are taking the quiz. Sorry about that, guys. Uh, so go ahead and uh, take that quiz. And this is the end of the uh, Khan Academy uh, portion on the Gilded Age. So as of today, we are done with the Gilded Age. Sorry, I thought we finished the Gilded Age on uh, day five, but I guess not. All right, next up, uh, we are going to review chapter 21 in your Tom Sawyer book. And uh, homework tonight is to read chapter 22. In science, we're going to read a little bit more about the uh, in the book about simple uh, machines. Um, I'm sorry, basic machines, not simple machines. Uh, and so last week we learned about the basic machine of the wedge and how it can be used in different ways. And we learned about the basic machine of the inclined plane. Uh, in our examples, we used a ramp. And so today we're going to be learning a little bit about the screw, uh, another basic machine, and about the lever. Uh, and so that is coming up later on. Uh, for group number one, we are learning about experimental probability, and you have a very short PDF worksheet. And in group number two, we are going over uh, powers and products of quotients. There is no new lesson for this. You just have to do the assignment. So let's go ahead and jump into the learning for today. Okay, for today's life skills class, uh, we are talking more about high school and we are discussing balancing your GPA and class schedule. So uh, your GPA, remember, is your grade point average, and the grade point average determines whether or not you can get accepted into things like internships, um, programs for trade schools, and especially if you're going to be uh, going out for uh, getting admitted into a college or university, you need to be very careful about managing your grade point average. And then uh, we want to be able to juggle the GPA and the class schedule. So uh, first up, when we're doing this, we have a couple classes that we know are going to be every year. So I'm going to call them your, uh, your, your, your regular classes. So these regular classes are the classes that you know you're going to have to take all the time. Then we have some classes uh, where you have to take some of the time, but not every single uh, semester. And we're going to call these semi-regular. And then the last one we're going to call, um, uh, I don't know, what's just up to you. So these are like your, your elective classes. So for your regular classes, the classes you'll pretty much have to take every semester in order to graduate. You have some kind of English class, some kind of math class, and for most of us, some kind of science class. So again, some, some English, some math, some science, uh, um, you know, these are something that you're going to have to do every single 
uh, a semester no matter what. Then we have the semi-regular classes that you uh, have to take sometimes, but again, not always. And so these semi-regular classes could include like a foreign language, Um, and social studies. And then finally, the up to you classes, the classes that are very elective. Um, we have a PE. Um, we have a lot of fun classes. We have home ec. And home economics is usually something like cooking. But they also teach you other things, like you take a cooking class. Isn't that great? You have driver's ed, which I highly recommend. Driver's ed. Help you all get ready for being drivers one day. Oh, what did that do? That's weird. Um, sorry, guys. Here. Undo. Go away. I don't want you. Okay. Driver's ed. What was I writing right there? Someone let me do it there. Okay, I guess that's all right though. Okay, um, we have music, art. You know, if you want to take a pottery class or a sculpting class. Or a painting class you get high school credits for that um, let me think um, what other oh you can do drama some high schools offer drama where you put on a play um, and uh, it, it is you get credit for it that is a lot of fun by the way that's a really good way to make friends which we're going to be talking about tomorrow is joining a drama club um, and so yeah and so we have these kind of three categories of classes now you always know that you're going to have to take one of these regular classes in English and math and a science and so these English, math, and science are, are, are mandatory, but you can choose which ones you take. Do you take advanced math or you take basic math? Um, that kind of thing. And so what you want to do is you want to balance your schedule. So if let, let's say, for instance, that the English class is really hard for you. And so uh, let's also say that social studies and foreign language, social studies is really easy, but foreign language is really hard. So, during the semester, when you're taking all three of these, and you're taking foreign language, if you're taking two really hard things, right there and right there, so if you're taking two things that are really hard out of the four, your fifth and sixth choices, you should try to make them really easy. And so maybe if, uh, if PE is really easy for you, you should take PE, to go with your two hard classes. And then maybe you could take a uh, driver's ed, which is also an easy class to pass with an A. And so kids, the idea is you want to figure out a way where you can mix up hard classes and then easier elective classes with those hard classes so that uh, so that even if you get like a B or a C in a hard class, you have enough easy classes to keep your GPA up with a bunch of easy A's. Um, and so that is the, the first part of what I wanted to talk to you today. Again, try to balance your GPA with your class schedule to make sure you're not taking too many hard classes all at one time. Now this next part I want to show you is kind of a cool trick. Give me one second. All right, never mind. I was going to show you guys uh, different websites that you could use that actually tell you about your teachers, but it turns out that people in Tucson just don't use them. So I couldn't find any uh, good ratings for any of the schools that you all might be going to. Uh, when you get to college, though, you know, uh, uh, you, you can you can find uh, sites like RateMyProfessors.com is the best one to tell you about all your different professors that you might be taking. Uh, some of you may even know some professors that are on that website right now. Um, but yeah, so anyway, uh, that's it for today's lesson. Let's go ahead and start talking about our current events. How's it going? All right, so today social studies is super quick and easy. First up, for current events, you have a PDF to complete, and the PDF I think either has like four or six questions. It is very brief, very easy. Please download it and do it. Finish it, send it in to Mr. Barbera and myself and get full credit. Again, easy A. All right.
like those. Uh, next up, after that, we have a, a Khan Academy uh, quiz that is going to close out um, all of the Gilded Age. So please go ahead and jump on Khan Academy and take that. Um, other than that, there is no social studies for the day. That is it for your current events, and that is it for your um, for your U.S. history. So tomorrow in current events in U.S. history, we start something totally new in both, which I'm kind of excited for. In current events, we are discussing the future, uh, or, or the plans that we've made for it, specifically plans coming up right around the corner, which uh, are kind of cool. And we start discussing America as an imperial power and some of our first colonies uh, in the modern age. All right, that's it for today. Let's go ahead and jump into literature. All right, it's time for literature, and let me check my notes. We were looking at chapter 21 in literature, and so in um, chapter 21 that you should have read uh, week 7, day 5, um, it's like the end of the year, and at the end of the year during these days, um, a lot of times, I suppose, instead of doing like finals, they would have this town meeting called the examination. And so they would all, uh, like a bunch of the people in the town would gather around the schoolhouse and it was kind of like a spelling bee and geography bee and a bunch of poetry uh, recital things all at one time. And so uh, they all came together to do it and I believe Tom chickened out of his. So he was doing Give Me Liberty or Give Me Death and he kind of chickened out. And then a bunch of the other students, I think they were all girls, uh, were reading like things that they had written and they were just really bad and, and it, was, it was so bad it was kind of funny um, and then at the very end um, the kids lower a blindfolded cat down from one of the rafters and the cat grabs like the toupee off the teacher's head to show that he's bald and uh, and then everyone laughs um, and the teacher's Mr. Dobbins is really really angry uh, and that was the whole chapter. Um, so it kind of is what it is. They show, you know, Tom going back to being a silly boy. And even though Tom is courageous to do certain things like run off and pretend to be dead and then come strutting in in front of everyone being like, hey guys, I'm, I'm alive. Even though he has the, um, the confidence to do crazy things like that, he doesn't have the confidence to do normal things like recite a speech in front of a crowd. And so it's kind of interesting that Tom is, he is good on his own terms, but when it comes to being like a normal boy that can do things in a way that other people find to be acceptable, he gets really nervous. And so uh, it's just an interesting character attribute for, for, for this fictional young man. All right, uh, that's it for today. Let's go ahead and move on to science. Hi right, hey everybody. So last week we learned about uh, uh, simple machines and uh, we learned that there are different kinds of simple machines and we specifically learned about the incline plane and the wedge. Today we're going to learn uh, or be introduced to screws and levers. So let's go ahead and start taking a look at the book here beginning with screws. So figure 14. These screws multiply force by increasing the distance over which you exert your force. The smaller the distance between threads, the greater the distance the screw travels and the less force you have to exert. Relating cause and effect. How does the distance between threads affect mechanical advantage? So let's go ahead and read through and find out. Have you ever wondered that, by the way, if you look at the threads, and the threads are the, like the swirly parts on the screw, why are the threads different on different kinds of screws? Now, they're very purposefully that way, so let's find out. So screws. Like a wedge, a screw is a simple machine that is related to the inclined plane. A screw can be thought of as an inclined plane wrapped around a cylinder. This spiral inclined plane forms the threads of the screw. When you use a screwdriver to twist a screw into a piece of wood, you exert an input force on the screw. As the threads of the screw turn, they exert an output force on the wood. If the threads of a screw are close together, you need to turn the screw many times in order to screw it into something. In other words, if you apply your input force over a long distance, as with all machines, this increased distance results in an increased output of force. The closer together the threads are, 
the greater is the mechanical advantage. So again, when the threads are close together, mechanical advantage is high. There are many other devices besides ordinary screws that take advantage of this principle. Examples include bolts, faucets, and jar lids. Think about a jar lid for a moment. You exert a relatively small input force when you turn the lid, but this force is greatly increased because the screw threads on the lid, which fit into matching threads on the jar. The result is that the lid is pulled against the top of the jar with a strong enough output force to make a tight seal. All right, and so when the threads are close together, you have to twist it for a longer time, but the input force is going over a longer distance, and so it's magnifying the output force, making it an equal amount of work. So that's how screws work. And again, screws and jar lids and several other things. So now let's, let's just read through the modeling a screw. Here's how to make a paper model of a screw. Cut out a triangle from a piece of paper. Tape the wide end of the triangle to the pencil. Then wind the paper around the pencil. How does this model resemble a real screw? Can you think of a way to calculate the ideal mechanical advantage of your model screw? See, and so you can kind of see like when it's wrapped around the pencil, it, it, it curves around in a cool way, just like a normal screw does. It's pretty neat. All right, so let's read about levers. Have you ever ridden on a seesaw or pried open a paint can with an opener? If so, you are already familiar with another simple machine called a lever. A lever is a rigid bar that is free to pivot, rotate about a fixed point. The fixed point that a lever pivots around is called the fulcrum. So again, lever and fulcrum, those are two critical words for this section of science. Uh, so, figure 15. This Calder mobile, entitled Lobster Trap and Fishtail, is in the Museum of Modern Art in New York City. See that? You kind of see the lobster tail and the trap. To understand how levers work, think about opening a paint can with a spoon. The spoon acts as a lever. The spoon rests against the edge of the can, which acts as the fulcrum. The tip of the spoon is under the lid of the can. When you push down on the handle, okay, you exert an input force and the spoon pivots about the fulcrum. As a result, the tip of the spoon pushes up, thereby exerting an output force on the lid, popping it open. The lever helps you in two ways. First, it increases the effect of your input force. Second, the lever changes the direction of your input force. So you're pushing down and the lid is pried up. So again, simple machines can change the direction and magnify force. And a lever, uh, in terms of the spoon when you're opening the paint can, is doing both. Different types of levers. When a spoon is used as a lever, the fulcrum is located between the input and output forces, okay? So again, you know, if this is the edge of the paint can and the paint can's lid is here and you put the spoon in here, okay, the spoon is resting on the edge here and that's the fulcrum and use it to pry it up, yeah? <clears throat> but this is not always the case. Here, we're right here, guys. There are three different types of levers classified according to the location of the fulcrum relative to the input and output forces. Examples are described in exploring three classes of levers. And in fact, I think we're reading that tomorrow. Yeah, I think that's going to be a reading for tomorrow. Advantage of a lever. When you open the paint can, you had to push the spoon handle for a long distance in order to move the lid a short distance. So again, the spoon is there, edge of the paint can is there. So this side, okay, this side moves a lot. So like your end of the spoon's moving a lot, but the, but the tip of the spoon's only moving a tiny bit, yeah? <clears throat> However, you were able to apply a smaller force than you would have without the spoon. You can calculate the ideal mechanical advantage of a lever using the distances between the forces and the fulcrum. Ideal mechanical advantage right here equals distance from fulcrum to input force over distance from fulcrum to output force. 
So again, the input force distance from the input force to over the distance from the output force. Remember the case of the paint can opener. The distance from the fulcrum, oh, here it's right here. The distance from the fulcrum to the input force was greater than the distance from the fulcrum to the output force. Okay, so this would be like the round end of your spoon, and this would be the spoon handle. Okay? This means that the ideal mechanical advantage was greater than 1. A typical ideal mechanical advantage for a paint can opener is 16 centimeters, so 16 centimeters here on this side, divided by 0 0.8 centimeters on this side, equals 20. That's a big advantage. So when, again, when you put the spoon in to pop open that lid, you're getting a mechanical advantage of 20. So your force pushing down is being magnified by a factor of 20. Pretty cool, huh? And in fact, that is the end of the reading for today. And tomorrow we're going to pick it up with three classes of levers. So we talked about a screw, which is the same thing as an inclined plane wrapped around a cylinder. And then we talked about a lever. So those were the two new basic, or, or I'm sorry, is it basic or simple? I don't remember. Uh, uh, whatever. We, those are the two machines that we learned about today. Tomorrow we're going to learn about the three types of levers, and we're moving on to pulleys. Thank you. And let's go ahead and do math. All right, ladies and gentlemen. So uh, for group number one for today and tomorrow, we are still focusing on probability, but a new part of probability, experimental probability. So let's go ahead and read about that together here, as experimental probability actually has a lot to do with um, what you've already done for your science fair experiment this year. Um, it probably would have been best if we covered this lesson first before we did the science fair experiments, but that's okay, and that's totally on me. I apologize. All right, so experimental probability. During hockey practice, Tanya made saves on 18 out of 25 shots. I'm assuming that is Tanya right there, right? Based on these numbers, what is the probability that Tanya will make a save on the next shot? Experimental probability is one way of estimating the probability of an event. It is based on actual experiments or observations. Experimental probability is found by comparing the number of times an event occurs to the total number of trials. The times that an experiment is carried out or an observation is made, the more trials you have, the more accurate the estimate is likely to be. Did I read that right? Anyway, it's the number of times the thing is happening that you're looking for in a fraction above the number of times the experiment is run. Yeah? And so for this one, Tanya was able to save 18 shots, so 18 would be the numerator, and then she was able to save 18 out of 25, 25 would be the denominator, so the probability that she can save the next one is 18 over 25. Uh, then you could reduce that to be, what is that, 18 is, um, actually no, they don't have a common denominator, so it'd be 18 over 25. Um, or if you did it in percentage terms, it'd just be 25 times 4 is 100, so 18 times 4 would be 32, 82%, is that right? Something like that. So probability is right here. The experimental probability is the number of times the event occurs on top of the total number of trials, just like I said, and then you turn it into a fraction, you get 18 over 25, yeah? And again, you can turn that into percent if you want, but you don't necessarily have to. All right, so recall that an outcome of an experiment can be impossible, certain or in between. If an event is impossible, it will never happen in any trial. Uh, so an impossible event equals zero over the total number of trials. So, uh, like for instance, let's talk about something impossible. So, out of, um, out of all 25 shots, Tanya never flew away. She never flew away. Because flying is impossible for human beings without the assistance of some kind of machine. So, zero out of 25 times, Tanya flew away from the ice skating rink. Okay, and so flying away from the ice skating rink for Tanya is impossible. 
I know that sounds silly, but you know, just using an example here. And so the chance that Tanya will fly away from the ice skating rink next time she goes to block a shot is 0 over 25. It is impossible. Yeah? If an event is certain, it will always happen in every trial. This means that the number of times the event happens is equal to the total number of trials. So the total number of trials on the bottom, and then the same number on top. All probabilities can be expressed numerically on a scale of 1 to 0. So again, on the 0 side, it's completely impossible. On the 1 side, it is certain. And in the middle, it is as likely as not. It's a 50-50 in the middle. Okay. If you're on this side of the 50-50, then it's unlikely. If you're on this side of the 50-50, it's likely. It's more than half. It's more than 50-50. More than a, uh, more than half the time it is that. All right. So let's go over a couple of examples. So first we have a weather application. For the past three weeks, Carl has been recording the daily high temperatures for a science project. During that time, the high temperature was above 75 degrees Fahrenheit, uh, 14 out of 21 days. What is the experimental probability that the high temperature will be above 75 uh, degrees Fahrenheit on the next day? So it is, uh, he has the total number of times, 14 over 21, uh, which is a total number of days. 14 over 21 equals 2 over 3 because it can be divided by 7. Yeah? So substitute 2 over 3. So the probability is 2 thirds. The experimental probability that the temperature will be above 75 degrees Fahrenheit on the next day is approximately 2 over 3. So next one, what is the experimental probability that the high temperature will be 75 or below on the next day? So what we're doing is it was 75 or above, and that's what we were testing for before. But now we're flipping it around. We're saying 75 or below. And so now we're looking for the opposite number. And so it was above 75, 14 days, below 75, 7 days. So now that 7 is going to be on top because we're looking for something different, but we're using the same data. So now we get 7 over 21, which reduces to 1 third, because that's the, that's the reduction, simplest form. So there's a 1 third chance that tomorrow, when uh, Carl goes to do the uh, temperature high reading, or the high temperature for the day, it will be less than 75 degrees. Okay, so that's it. Uh, today we're going to be doing some uh, a worksheet with a couple uh, quick and um, easy problems as long as you remember this right there. The total number, uh, I'm sorry, the number that we're looking for in a fraction above the total number and that gives us the experimental probability. That's all you have to remember. If you need a little extra help, you might want to watch this part of the today's lesson over again. Otherwise, go ahead and get started on that PDF uh, that is linked to the account. Thanks so much, and since this is the end of your school day, have a great day, Group 1. We'll see you again tomorrow for Week 8, Day Number 2. All right, Group Number 2. It's time for you. Uh, so today for group number two, we're going to be doing some more practice on Khan Academy. Uh, today we're doing one practice set. Tomorrow we're doing a second practice set. Uh, it all has to do with exponents and powers. As you already probably have figured out, exponents and powers are uh, very important uh, and like a fundamental uh, basic for algebra. And so we're going to be doing a bunch of practice with those. Uh, tomorrow on week eight, day number two, you're also going to be reading a short um, like PDF uh, that they have on Khan Academy as well, just kind of reviewing it all. Uh, once you finish today's practice and tomorrow's practice, we're on to the next topic for week eight, day number three. So no new lesson, doing the same stuff you already know how to do. We're just kind of putting it into practice. All right, uh, that's it for today. Have a wonderful rest of your day after you do your homework. Thanks, guys. Oh, and girls, and toaster. <laughs>